Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News as we kick off what looks to be an incredibly slow week in the movie news cycle. Why? Because Christmas is literally a week away and as the world winds down for the holiday, so does Tinseltown. Ah, Tinseltown, a perfect name for this time of year for Hollywood. But you know what this means? This means that it is also the perfect time of year for viewer questions because I see a lot of viewer question based episodes in our future for the remainder of the week. Uh, that's because I promised you a full week of morning movie news episodes before uh, a brief hiatus until after New Year's because the news cycle is really going to slow down after Christmas. But there will still be uh, videos on the main Beyond the Trailer channel. Now speaking of the main Beyond the Trailer channel, we're still going to have some fun, even though there's not a lot of stuff going on in the movie business right now. And that's tomorrow night with a live viewing of it. Oh, I'm so excited to watch with you guys. It's going to be nighttime. It's going to be dark. It's going to be scary. I'm going to have my... I'm going to have my caramel popcorn for the circus, but then also one of you suggested Sour Patch Kids because it's eating little kids, right? Uh, just like Pennywise, and I thought that was a great choice. So those are my two uh, snacks that I have planned, and I hope that you have some fun snacks planned as well. Uh, just to give you the details, uh, again, I'm going to be watching It live tomorrow night on YouTube, so you can watch along with me at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time followed by a live Q&A at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so this is how it works, because I tweeted about it over the weekend, and some of you, new to the channel, never watched a movie with me live before, uh, were asking about the details. So what you do is uh, tomorrow it comes out digitally for digital purchase. And I know some of you like for me to wait until the physical copy comes out, but this is going to be uploaded on YouTube um, after after the event, after the live event, so I'll be able to watch with you anytime that's good for you. You can access both the, the feature film commentary, basically, that's what it is, and also the Q&A, even after the, uh, they air live. So anyway, if you want to join me live, what you do is you purchase it digitally tomorrow. You can buy it in advance, but you can always get it tomorrow before 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then you tune in uh, onto YouTube, and I'll have... Um, Sometime tomorrow, the actual placeholder video will go up to let you know that it's going to happen. Uh, and then at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll come online. You'll be ready waiting. You'll have your movie queued up. And then we both press play at the same time. I'll have a timer on, though, to make sure we can stay... Um, synced up, you know, an on-screen timer, and then we'll watch the movie together. It's a lot of fun. I've done it a couple of times before. Uh, never for a horror movie, though, so I think we're really going to have a good time. I can't wait. It's a fun holiday treat, I think. All right, so that's the, that's the first thing I wanted to cover today, just to, let, to remind you that that's going to happen tomorrow night and the logistics of it. Uh, now, I have two stories and then a viewer question, and again, get those viewer questions in for the rest of the week. So, and these are two very business-oriented stories, because again, not a lot's happening, um, because they know that not a lot of people are paying attention to the news, because everybody has their own holiday plans. Uh, but the first story of the day uh, is fascinating. These are actually both very interesting stories. Uh, Saudi Arabia, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Sal Salman has lifted the 35-year ban on movie theaters in the country. And it's said to be a billion-dollar market. They have a lot of theme parks in the Middle East. They certainly do enjoy popular culture there. Uh, and so Hollywood and the rest of the uh, world's film industries are salivating at the chance to get in there. Now, of course, there's a little bit of an obstacle called censorship, and they're very nervous. You know, Hollywood is a little bit concerned about which of their movies will be able to play there. But, you know, it's something they're already dealing with with China, and China's very, you know, picky about what goes into their country. So I think, you know, this is just another list for Hollywood to have to check for those major films. It's a fascinating situation, though. Let's take the DC movies, for instance. They don't think that Gal Gadot's uh, Wonder Woman would be able to play there because she's uh, Israeli and very strongly backs the region. So they think that, that probably would not be allowed in the country, which is, you know, very interesting. But they said that at the first Comic-Con that they've had there in Saudi Arabia, Jason Momoa was a big hit. So Aquaman, uh, and the theaters will be open in time for Aquaman, uh, could potentially do quite well there. Uh, the first movie uh, theaters will open in March 2018, and it's also interesting because Disney's Aladdin comes out in 2019, and this would, I think, be a very big market for that film as well. Uh, you know, just like China, it's, it's, it's uh, anticipated that Saudi Arabia will really enjoy those blockbusters, those tentpole movies that Bob Iger loves so much. Uh, but what I think is the most interesting thing here is with this added stream of sig significant stream of revenue, uh, will it change representation in movies, just like what's happened with China and, you know, just Asia in general? You know, the holy trinity of the Asian box office, we talk about it all the time, 
China, Japan, and South Korea, but China's the big one there. Uh, but that has led to a lot more roles for Asian talent. Uh, and, you know, movies like Mulan coming up, where they cast a Chinese actress. So they've been talking a lot about opportunities for filmmakers in Saudi Arabia, but I think also for probably in front of the camera talent as well. Uh, you'll probably see even more films shoot there and probably cast local talent in supporting roles. And maybe eventually, if enough money is generated in Saudi Arabia, in leading roles. And I think this would be a fabulous development because, as we all know, for the most part, these days, Middle Eastern characters tend to be the villains in popular entertainment coming out of the West. So this would be, I think, um, you know, as we have always said, Hollywood only does things when money is involved. They're not particularly interested in doing anything just because of the good of society. <laughs> so this would be, I think, a very interesting development indeed. And perhaps maybe that's one of the reasons that the crown prince decided to lift the ban, because he wants to change the way the Middle East is depicted in, again, Western popular entertainment, which still, to this day, drives popular entertainment overall. Fascinating. I can't wait to hear your thoughts about it down below. All right, so now the second story of the day, I don't know how I feel about this one. So let's also discuss this one below. But Hollywood is moving forward with this commission that Kathleen Kennedy proposed, you might recall. A commission, it's being called, on sexual harassment and advancing equality in the workplace. Hmm, this seems problematic to me. But they have to do something. Hollywood is really continuing to have horrible problems, as you see day after day in the headlines. And apparently, I've heard rumors, even outside of the headlines, a lot of people are being fired. So Anita Hill is going to chair this commission. Uh, and of course, she was one of the first people to fight sexual harassment in the 1990s opposite Clarence Thomas, although he still went on to the Supreme Court and he still has got to stay there. Uh, but, you know, she feels that she was maybe ahead of her time. So Anita Hill, great face for the committee. Uh, and then here's who's going to be on it. And all they've done is have an initial meeting and be like, you know, congratulate themselves and say, OK, this is great. But they haven't talked about it all what they're going to do. And that's going to happen after the new year. So here's who's on it. Kathleen Kennedy, because it was her idea. Bob Iger, Bob Iger, because he's everywhere, right? Don Hudson, who is the CEO of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the, the, the group that holds the Oscars. Uh, Gabriel Carteris, the president of SAG, uh, you know, one of the most, I think, uh, harassed groups in the industry, act actors and actresses. Uh, Jeff Blackburn, a senior vice president of uh, business development at Amazon. Jeff Schell, chairman of Universal Film Entertainment Group. Jim Giannopoulos, we've been talking a lot about him. He just left Fox recently, uh, and he's now heading up Paramount after Brad Gray's unfortunate um, passing. Kevin Sujihara is on here from Warner Brothers. Uh, you obviously are familiar with that name. But we've also heard that name recently with him, you know, being said to give Brett Ratner a lot of preferential treatment and overlooking a lot of bad behavior from Brett Ratner. So I thought it was interesting that he was on this commission. Has he turned a corner, or is it to get Brett Ratner out of trouble? Also, Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer at Netflix. You should know all these names. Uh, Tony uh, Vinciera, I do not know that one, the CEO of Sony. Uh, and then Les Moonves, obviously, the head of um, CBS uh, overall. That's a lot of guys on the commission. I was surprised how many guys were on there. You want guys on there, obviously, because anyone can be harassed. And I think it's important to have someone also looking out for the interests of those who could potentially be falsely accused. That's how these things always go. You know, it starts out really good, but then it starts to get twisted for people's own potential gain. So, you know, it would be horrible to see a situation develop where someone anyone could say to another individual, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to accuse you of harassment. And to today's culture, that could be career ending. So I think it's important to have men and women on the committee, but it seems like it has more men than women, and I find that odd. Uh, also, you'll see that no one has been added to the committee that has been very aggressively tweeting about uh, this stuff in social media. And I think that's the whole point of this committee, to keep things quiet, to have things done. You know, some people might say, well, it's why should, you know, the whole problem is that these things happen behind closed doors. Why would you want to keep it behind closed doors? And I think it's because, again, of what I said about the concern of false accusations and, you know, uh, a, a, a guilty until proven innocent mentality that's emerged. So I'm in favor of the commission. I hope that it's effective. I think it has a, not, it's not as balanced out as I would like it to be. And uh, I think that Maybe I would have some non-Hollywood faces on here because, you know, again, everybody here is wheeler and dealer and they have, you know, all of the same goal at the end of the day and that's success within their industry. So maybe it would be a good idea to have some people who have nothing to do with Hollywood and therefore they could maybe keep the thing a little bit in check. Uh, but I'm curious, what do you think of this group? What do you think of Anita Hill chairing it? Who do you think, what do you think of who's on it? Do you think it'll be effective? Um, and I suspect that many industries will be starting such institutions uh, 
pretty darn soon. All right, so I have a viewer question for today, and I thought it was very interesting, actually, and it's from Carla Lopez. Uh, she asked it last week, so Carla, thank you for this great question. Uh, and Carla said, hi, Grace, question. Why do you think people enjoy and don't criticize so much DC properties outside the DCEU, like the animated movies, TV series, and animated series, and they're all very popular among people? In contrast, the MCU has a great success on film, but not so much with other properties of Marvel's, with some exception. Great, great question. Well, Carla, I think the situation is that when the people who are, the people who are enjoying the DC properties outside of the movies are a much smaller group, and they tend to be made up almost entirely of people who are inclined to enjoy this stuff because they like the DC properties. For instance, I've had horrible problems with a lot of the animated stuff, uh, and you know they're starting to have some problems as Bruce Tim kind of loses it. But I've had a problem with just uh, doing anim animated adaptations of popular stories. I wish they did more original content, which is why I'm very excited for Batman Ninja, as it's an original story and it's really, um, I think, very bold. I think that's fabulous. But anyway, again, the audience for these things is smaller and it consists of people who are pro-DC to begin with and are really into the comics. I think the problem with the DCEU is that they reach beyond the core fan base and those people just are not having it. <laughs> so I think that's the, that's the situation. Uh, with the MCU, it really is an inverse situation between the two. And the MCU, I think, is so successful in the movie space that they don't want to risk it with having any negative word of mouth on any other uh, explorations. That's changing a little bit with the upcoming Miles Morales animated Spider-Man movie, which kicked off fabulously with the, um, with the t teaser trailer from Brazil Comic Con. I'm very excited about that. And if that does well, perhaps Marvel will get more into animation. Uh, but I think that that's, the, and also Sony's spearheading that. It's not coming so much out of uh, Disney. Although Disney Animation did Big Hero 6, and there has been talk about another Disney uh, Marvel animated property as well, something focusing on uh, diversity also, which is interesting, you know, considering that they push diversity in both cases and, and, um, uh, with, this, with the Miles Morales situation and other Marvel characters to animation. And Big Hero 6 was a diversity situation as well. Uh, but anyway, I think that's what the situation is. Uh, DC's other projects are, are well regarded because of a small core fan base that, uh, that enjoys them. I don't think they have much crossover appeal, to be honest with you. And I think the MCU does not want to take any risks. But that risk-averse averse behavior has led to pushing diversity to animation because I think they feel that is um, a less riskier space. So anyway, that's my answer to your question, Carla. Great question. I'd be curious to hear everyone else's thoughts down below uh, on Carla's question uh, and the two stories of the day. And don't forget to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to watch it live. All right, thanks so much for tuning in and you can check out some more videos right now.